Now, the EU has moved uh, closer to creating its own military force. Euro MPs have voted to create armed defences which are separate from NATO and it is expected to be operational in less than a year. With the details, here's Polly Boyko. This resolution has passed relatively quietly, but it marks a really significant moment, actually. The European Parliament has agreed to form what it's calling a European Defence Union, what many others would simply call an EU army. And the resolution where they've announced this talks about threats of terrorism, cyber security, energy and security as justifications for its decision in uh, forming this defence union. And it argues that the money that they spend uh, as pulled together will be more efficient as a, a multinational force with its own EU headquarters to uh, command and control crisis operations. And crucially, it would allow the EU to act quickly where NATO is unwilling to do so. Now, when it comes to how it will be funding, this is the interesting bit, because the plan at the moment is for EU countries to contribute 2 percent of their GDP to the new venture. And this is where you could have a problem because EU countries are already supposed to be contributing 2% of GDP to that other big military alliance that they're already part of, or the majority of them anyway, um, NATO. And a lot of them are seriously falling short on that figure of 2% GDP. Countries like France, Germany and Italy, how they're supposed to stump up two sets of 2% GDP on military spending isn't clear. It's anyone's guess, really. And um, if it goes ahead, it's not clear how taxpayers across the EU will feel about having to spend all that money on two sets of military clubs. Money aside, there's NATO as a consideration as well. NATO's always been against the EU army. Take a listen to the current head of NATO talking about the prospect of an EU army. NATO nations and EU members simply cannot afford two sets of forces and capabilities. We share 22 members, so to duplicate would be like competing with ourselves. Now, two things to point out here about this resolution that went through. It's only just scraped through the European Parliament. It was by no means a unanimous vote, and there were abstentions. So get ready to hear more about this in sort of the coming weeks and months. And you've got to remember that uh, at the moment, all this is just a resolution. So it's a statement of intent. And as a lot of viewers will know, there is a big gulf between wanting something and being able to make it a reality. All right, well, let's discuss this a bit further now with political writer and journalist too, Dan Glazebrook. He joins us. Uh, good evening to you, Dan. Um, what do you make of this, then? Is this a surprise that this resolution went through, given the fact that NATO seems to be dead set against it? Not really a surprise. I mean, to be honest, the, the, the unrivaled dominance and hegemony with which the USA emerged from the Second World War was always going to be temporary and, um, and historically relatively short-lived. And I think since, since the economic crises, um, the crisis of U.S. hegemony from the 1970s onwards, it's always been a matter of time, actually, before uh, its subordinate partners would start getting um, uh, rankled and upset uh, with, with U.S. policy and, and start to actually want to break away and do something more independent. And I think what we're seeing now is, on the, on, uh, is, is two, two things. <clears throat> we're seeing actually the return of what Lenin used to call inter-imperialist rivalry. So on the one hand, the US deep, I mean, the whole world's in a, deep in the midst of a, a global capitalist crisis. The US is increasingly unable and uh, under Don Donald Trump, increasingly unwilling to actually finance the uh, costs of the military umbrella, US military umbrella over Europe. On the one hand, so it's getting hacked off with, with, with NATO for its own reasons and the, uh, the, uh, the having to stump up the cash for Europe's protection. On the other hand, the EU itself is, is um, realizing that subordinating itself to the US is increasingly a game of, of diminishing returns. Take the example of uh, Ukraine, the Ukraine crisis. France and Germany and other European countries really had no interest in starting a trade war with Russia over Ukraine, but the US prodded them and effectively maneuvered them and forced them into doing it. And why was the US able to do that? Because of the European dependence on the US military uh, umbrella. So I think they're, they're, they're realizing that if they want to act independently, if they want to stop being used to do the US's bidding in actually quite self-defeating moves like trade wars with Russia, uh, then they're going to have to 
um, strike out on their own. So sure. we really are seeing the return with a vengeance of this inter-imperialist yeah. rivalry. Yeah. Interestingly, Dan, today one of the reasons given wasn't so much about uh, NATO's sort of aggressive stance in the past, but the fact it might not be perhaps proactive enough in the future. It might not take the lead, it says, uh, when we feel it is necessary. Uh, what sort of scenario could that be, do you think? Well, there have been rivalries in the past between the US and the EU um, in Yugoslavia, for example, with, with the US and, and, and uh, Germany backing different sides in the Yugoslav uh, wars of the 1990s. And actually, that, 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 that rivalry there played a major role in exacerbating and even causing um, many elements within that conflict. We've seen rivalries um, over spheres of influence in Africa, um, Francophone and Anglophone, uh, Anglophone Africa. So there's many different regions and areas in which you might see um, potentially, you know, the U.S. backing one side and, and the EU backing another side. In fact, already in Libya, you've got a situation where um, French uh, special forces are aiding one side in the Libyan civil war and British special forces, Britain, of course, with this special relationship with the U.S., very close to the U.S., British special forces backing another side. So there's, we're already in a situation where actually you're potentially getting British and French shooting at each other in Africa and there's many, uh, many regions where, where that kind of scenario could unfold potentially. OK, it's still a big if, isn't it? But it's interesting to see how it will all uh, develop there. Mm. Thanks, Dan. We'll leave it for the moment. That was Dan Gladesbrook, polit uh, political writer okay. and journalist. Thank you.